enthroned in this room today, there is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who deserves in our presence a standing ovation. Let's do it again unto him and shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. You can do it better than that. You can do it much, much better than that. For he is worthy of our praise and our worship and our adoration. For of his kingdom there shall never ever be an end. Hallelujah, Jesus. The Lord has spoken to me. I have lain awake at night, struggling in my heart and in my soul with one of the most perilous issues in this hour. I would like for you to turn in your Bibles with me today to the book of Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6. Beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible. Everyone say impossible. For those who were once enlightened. And have tasted. Say tasted. Of the heavenly gift. And were made partakers. Say partakers. Of the Holy Ghost. And have tasted. Say that word again the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. I want to entitle this today Our heritage. Would you pray with me sincerely before you are seated? Lord Jesus, today we stand in a magnificent atmosphere because you have graced it with your divine presence. We have already heard from the word of the Lord and there is great contrition that has come upon our minds and our hearts. We find ourselves today facing the end of the age and there are perilous times upon us and there is treachery afoot in this hour we pray now that because greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world that a spirit of revelation and understanding will come in upon this congregation today and that the gift of faith in all of its power and perspective will be released here that angels will begin to walk among us and touch us individually and conglomerately. We pray today in the matchless resplendent name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. I'd like us to clap just one more time because I like it and God likes it. Hallelujah. The reason that I ever came to God, the reason that I ever came to believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah was because a preacher preached it. 
But that is not the thing that caused me to really believe it. The thing that caused me to believe it was as he preached, I felt the convicting power of the Spirit of God. And I was convinced by the convicting power of God that Jesus was God and that I needed Him. I was convinced by a conviction. The reason that I came from another church to this one and was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ was because it was preached to me. And the convicting power of God in that service persuaded me that I needed to be baptized in the name of Jesus. It was not Brother Butcher. It was not the local assembly that coerced me into it or forced me into it. It was the Spirit of God. The convicting power of God persuaded me this was right. The reason I began to raise my hands and seek the Lord for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, even though I had been told something different in the Evangelical Free Church, the reason that I forsook that and began to reach for this is because it was preached. And when it was preached, the convicting power of God began to re-persuade my thinking and my mind. And he told me it was true and it was necessary. And so I received it. The reason that I believed in divine healing is because it was preached. And I had been terribly hurt in a car accident. And because it was preached among you, the Spirit of God, by His convicting power, opened my heart and mind to the truth that healing was in the atonement and that it was not antiquated, but it was a reality in our day. And I got it. The reason that I began to pay tithes consistently and give offerings is because it was preached to me from the word of the Lord and the convicting spirit of God in my life upon me individually persuaded me that this was a Bible precedent and a truth. The reason that I began to practice holiness in my life is because it was preached and what was preached was so different from what I had come out of. It took me about a year to get it together. Even when I was in Bible school, some of the faculty members tried to re-persuade me from going in some of the directions I was going. But it was not the church or the school that was doing this, it was something that had been preached and the Holy Ghost opened my mind and my eyes to the need of separation to come out from among them and be a separate people unto God and touch not the unclean thing and the promise was that He would receive me. So what I am saying today is this, that everything we have ever received from God or everything that we ever will receive from God has come to us by the convicting power of the Spirit of the Lord. We are doing what we are doing today because the convicting Spirit of God persuaded us mentally and emotionally that this thing was true, that it was righteous. And so we have forsaken houses and lands and mothers and fathers and positions and avocations and lifestyles. And we have come to a place like this to do one thing, to give attestation, to give credence, to give veneration, to give loyalty, to give worship to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords, whose name is Jesus of Nazareth, of whose kingdom there shall never ever be an end. In other words, this that we feel today is going to go on and on and on and on and on. It is never, ever going to stop. If you believe that, clap your hands again, and this time shout 
unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. For he is great, and he is greatly to be praised. Hallelujah, Jesus. I have heard it preached during the years I have been in this, 24 now. I have heard it preached that the text I cited for you and read for you today means if a person ever really, really backslides, and by that they meant to really go out and just do it all. They told me that you could never ever get back to God. However, I have lived long enough to understand and know that that is not really what the scriptures are dealing with there. Because I have seen too many people who really went out and did it all. I have stood beside too many caskets and knew that they made it in the end result. So it cannot mean to backslide. It may be applicable, but it is not the crux of the matter. It is not what God is trying to tell us. There was a man who came to my church. I pastored him. He lived for God for a time. He backslid. When he backslid, it was obvious right away to the fellow workers on the job that he was no longer living the way he had once lived. And they picked up on that, and they will. They picked up on that, and they began to make fun of the church. And he joined in with them and made such statements as, there was nothing to it. The Holy Ghost never really did anything for me, just a bunch of jibber-jabber. And he mocked this, and he walked away from it willingly, of his own volition. Time came and went. We had revivals. People came through. This man came back in an atmosphere of faith and power. He came to the altar again, and he did what we call pray through. Weeks passed, and suddenly he was missing again, and he was gone. He did not stick. There was another woman who came to one of the churches I pastored. This girl lived for God for quite a while. Suddenly, she backslid in the interim between my pastoring when I was evangelizing. She came back to God, but the reason that something happened for her that did not happen for this man is that when the fellow workers on the job picked up on her, and began to make fun of Pentecostalism and our lifestyle and our dress modes and all of this, she stopped them cold and she said, I'm not living it. She said, don't you judge me. She said, by what they stand for. She said, and don't judge them by the way I'm living because they really have what they say they have. And it really is real. It's just that I'm not living it anymore. Time came and time went. In a revival she came and she gloriously prayed through and she is still living for God today. Why? Why did she make it? And why did he not make it? The reason is simple. Because he committed the unpardonable. He lost his convictions. He lost convictions that this thing was true and he mocked it and made fun of it and walked away but though she did not live it she never ever forgot that it was real she never stopped believing that this thing was true in her heart the convictions remained and she knew though she was not living it that this was the truth and when she came back she prayed through and she made it There was a woman who came to one revival where I was. She looked to me like a saint of God. For all appearances, she was a saint of God. I did not know the congregation. She came to the altar at the end of the preaching. And for a moment, I thought she was just a saint. The preacher came running to me. He said, Brother Stone King, that woman has been backslidden for 25 years. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. I knelt down. It took about 30 minutes. But all of a sudden, that woman began to pray through and she began to speak with tongues.
tongues. The thing that threw me was this, that though she did not live it, she still believed it. In 25 years, a pair of scissors had never touched her hair. She had never stopped dressing this way. She believed it. Her convictions were sound. They were true. She knew what God had told her. One ear had been deaf from birth, and when she began to speak with tongues, that deaf ear snapped open, and she was able to hear. Why does God do things like that? He does things like that because we hold to his precepts and to his concepts, because his truth is from everlasting to everlasting. It is amazing to me. It's amazing to me. This is the most treacherous hour that man has ever lived in. But it is the greatest hour that man has ever lived in. Because as the forces of darkness become darker, the light is beginning to shine brighter, and the glory of God is upon us. But I warn you, as a man of God, if you ever lose your convictions, if you ever allow anybody to talk you out of what God has painstakingly taken the time to teach you in the privacy of your own home, at your bed, with tears and groanings. If you ever of your own free will lay down the revelation and understanding of the oneness of God, baptism in Jesus' name, the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues, or modesty and holiness, if you ever let go of it, friend of mine, it is impossible to ever renew you to repentance. Once you have ever let go of your convictions, not backslide, but once you let go of your convictions, they will be gone from you forever and forever and forever and you will never ever get them back I have made up my mind this past year that no matter what anybody else does no matter what anybody else says no matter who says or doesn't say it this boy is not going to let go of one thing I'm going to hold on to everything that God has ever whispered in my ear more soundly, more profoundly than I ever had in all of the years I have served God I'm not going to let go of it I don't care what you do but I know what I'm going to do I'm going to hold on to this because there is nothing like it that never has been that never will be again this is it this is it, this is it, this is it, this is it. I am persuaded, I am persuaded that when God, look how long he has worked with some of us to get us where we are. What extents God has gone to to help some of us. The years that he has painstakingly worked with us put up with us, been patient with us, suffered with us. And then all of a sudden one day, you have so-and-so over tea or coffee or a hunting trip or whatever it is your thing is, and God passes by and he hears you chatting, talking. I don't know if brother so-and-so is right. I don't know if all this stuff is really necessary. I don't think we have to do all of these things. Or he comes by and hears a couple of preachers talking. And after all he has done to help them, after all he has done to raise them up, after all the times he has picked them up and helped them, years of working with us, a couple of preachers get together, or two or three or four or five, and he walks by and he hears them say, I think if we just let down a few things, we could build a church of a thousand. I think if we just let go of a few things and we're not quite so strict here, that we could just attract more people. And God stops, and he listens to that, and there is an anger that rises up in his face. There is something that begins to rise up in him, and God becomes so provoked with that type of thing that one day he walks by, and he says, okay, buddy, you want to believe it? I'll help you to believe it. And he will send a strong delusion, and you will believe. There are five billion people in this world, and most of them have never heard the name of Jesus. And while we fuss over do's and don'ts, and I'm not going to, 
There are over 125,000 souls today that have dropped into the fires of hell. A terrible scripture is written in Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians 2 says, beginning at verse 9, even him, speaking of the Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. People, it's not enough to have the truth. You've got to love this. It's not enough to have received it. You've got to love this. We have got to love this. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, what cause? Because they did not love the truth, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. People, hear me. It is one thing to be deceived by a fellow man. You can come out of that. You can work your way out of it. You can pray your way out of it. It's another thing to be deceived by the devil. You can be delivered from that. We can lay hands on you and you can be delivered. But if God ever deceives you, you're finished. It's over. If God ever deceives you, it's over. There is no hope. Toward the end of that hippie era, with all the frumpy clothes and the beards and the mustaches and the long hair and everything else that went with it, I was preaching evangelizing. Brother Donalds, I think, who was here, was with me at that time. He was with me in that meeting. I preached for Brother Frank Poling in Talmadge, Ohio. We were there the first week, only eight got the Holy Ghost. In the last meeting, the first week, 40-some had received the Holy Ghost. And Brother Poling, I could tell, was distressed because there were not as many people receiving the Holy Ghost in his meeting as in the meeting we had just conducted. And the only reason that preachers ask evangelists to come preach for them is because they want the same results in their church you got in the last church you just left. That's how it really is. And so I knew that he wanted the same results that I had just received. We fasted just as much. We prayed more. And we were doing the same type of thing. I was preaching as hard as I could and working in the altar like I always do. But nothing was happening. And so I went to Brother Pauling. I said, Brother Pauling, you are the pastor here. You are sovereign. This is your church. I'm only an evangelist. But I know what the problem is. I know what the problem is. I said, if you will let me preach what I feel, we will have a move of God. I said, if you would rather I didn't, I said, it's all right. I can close it Sunday night, and I have someplace else I can go. I said, but I know what the problem is. He said, Brother Strong King, you do anything you want to, boy, have at it. That's all I need. That's just all that I ever need. I want you to know, those people had no, they were not prepared for what was coming. I mean, for the next two nights, I went at it. I went through everything that was sinful and worldly, and I wiped the situation out, so to speak. By the end of the second night, you see, that whole crowd, they were a bunch of new converts. They had their frumpy clothes on. They had their beads. They had all kinds of stuff. And they had mascara, and they had makeup, and they had beards, and they had mustaches, and they had all of this stuff. All of it. The whole congregation looked that way. By the end of the second night, those men did not even wait for the barbershops to open the next morning. They got together with brushes and shaving lather and razors and scissors, and they began to go at it. And the next night, I didn't even recognize the crowd. I mean, they looked totally different. But I can promise you as a man of God, that week, 64 people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues. Why? Because God, God... God doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to put his hand of approval upon things like that. But he does. You know why he does? Because he wants it. Because he desires it. Because he has always desired it. Wherever there is God, there is holiness. Wherever God walks, there must of necessity be holiness. He will not stay where there is unholiness. He only walks where there is holiness. Mm. What do you think would happen here in Alexandria if Brother Anthony Mangan came to this pulpit, God forbid, and announced to this whole church after we're all gone, we're going to do things differently here. 
we are going to rip out all these beautiful pews and we're going to come to church and we're going to sit cross-legged on this floor and we're going to shave our heads and we're going to grow these long hairlocks from the top of our heads and we're going to wear orange kimono robes and we're going to pass out flowers now we're still going to carry our bibles and we're still going to speak with tongues and we're still going to baptize in jesus name and there's only one god but we're just going to change the rest of the format and we're going to come here and sit like this and we're going to sway and we're going to go back and forth and we're going to do all this stuff what do you think would happen I'll tell you what would happen. The spirit of Hare Krishna would come to this assembly. The spirit of Hare Krishna would come to this assembly. And you would fight devils unlike anything you have ever fought. When we bring that that is out there into the sanctuary, when you bring this world into the sanctuary, you bring the spirits of the age into the sanctuary. When you follow the trends and the fashions of this world, you bring those spirits into the house of God. And you're going to have to fight devils. We are not fighting people. We are fighting spirits. We are not fighting people. We are fighting spirits. David Wilkerson wrote a book entitled Purple Violet Squish. He said, quote, To all my minister friends around the world who want to reach the runaway generation, you cannot win rebels by being like them. Put away your childish talk. God is not groovy or hip, and Christ is not a cool cat. Jargon does not make the gospel relevant. It is still the simple preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ that leads to redemption. Take off your love beads and cookie clothes. If you become a mixer, you will get mixed up. You will not reach this generation by what you say, but by what you are and by the way that you live. May I say to you today, there are people among us who are mixed up and others are becoming mixed up. You cannot mix with the mixers and stay straight. You cannot do it. You will get mixed up because there are spirits that buy for this church. There are spirits now trying to take us over. But I am here to declare for this generation, we will not be taken over. 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 Second Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 12 says, But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them that desire occasion, wherein they glory they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. He's talking there about humanity. But he goes on and says, And no marvel... For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. We don't think of the devil as being an illustrious, ethereal, gossamer, mysterious angel of light that is attractive. We think of him in other ways. Red, tails, horns, whatever. We don't think of him being an angel. But then listen to this. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers... also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works we don't think about the devil having ministers ministers like jesus has ministers going out and preaching we don't think of that but the bible says that he does would you like me to tell you where you'll find a lot of them you'll find them on quote unquote Christian radio and other places and the world the world is just reeling with all kinds of ideas the thing that is so devastating to us is that there are so many kinds of Christianity. In the beginning, you were either a Jew, a heathen, or a Christian. And there was only one kind of Christian. 
And if you said you're a Christian, they knew automatically that you believe this man called Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the one true God robed in flesh. They knew that you also had been baptized in his name because the Christians had said he had risen from the dead. They also knew that they spoke with tongues and the believers laid hands on the sick and they went everywhere and nothing could stop them. They knew what a Christian was in the beginning, but you may not know what a Christian is in this hour. If a person says, I am a Christian, you're going to have to ask them questions. What kind of a Christian? What kind of a Christian are you? There are so many different kinds. And people come along and say, I have the truth. And we say, we have the truth. What is the truth? Pilate wanted to know. The Bible says in 1 John 4 and 1, try the spirits and see if they be of God. I have never worked with that until this past year, but I have worked with it, I have worked with it, I have worked with it. Let me tell you, there are a lot of things that sound right. There are a lot of things that look right, but they are not right. They go through the motions, but they are not right. I asked Brother T.W. Barnes, who is my wonderful friend, he's a mentor to me. Brother Barnes, I said, Brother Barnes, uh, how can some men whom I have heard preach so powerfully and so gloriously, how can they carry on when we have now discovered that they are living in sin? He said, Brother Stone King, when the Holy Ghost leaves a powerful ministry, there is another spirit that comes that replaces the Holy Ghost. And he said, that spirit looks a great deal like the Holy Ghost. And unless you are gifted in the Spirit, he said, you will not realize it and you will not recognize it and they will carry on for a season. God forbid, God forbid that any of us He's in this place, in this conference, in a way he's never been so far. And he is here to do something. And he's going to do it. I want to propose something to you. If an army can capture a city, why can't the church capture a city for Jesus? The apostles turned their cities upside down. Hitler the most diabolical men who ever has ever lived in history. Adolf Hitler! If one man, through and under the power of Satan, could change the world for evil, if Stalin, under the power of evil forces from the regions of damnation, could march forth to enslave one half of the world's population, weaving a hundred million souls into the vortex of communism, it is not, it is not, it is not unreasonable! Not presumptuous for me to say to you today that a man of God, under the anointing of faith, inspired by a vision of God's power, can stand forth to change the world for God and right. But I'm going to tell you how it will come. It will come to those who stand for the simple truth that God has whispered in our ears through the centuries and through the generations that His people will be a peculiar people, a treasure unto Him above all the people of the earth. Popsy, is it possible that your generation told us incorrectly? Is it possible that the things you have always stood for are now obsolete and modernism should creep in upon us? I say nay and yea, amen to the Lord. It is not, it is not wrong what you have taught us. It is not wrong what Brother Kilgore's father taught us. It is not wrong. It was right and it is still right. A.D. Urshan was right and he is still right. His son is right and he is still right. For the tenor, you are right and you are still right. We are right. In this place, let's clap again for the Lord and worship Him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. There is now a deported guru who left Oregon, who owned a fleet of Rolls Royces. I have seen his converts on jets as I have crisscrossed the northern part of the country in their frumpy clothes, wearing these 
medallions with this guru's picture on their chest, hanging from leather thongs around their necks. When he would come on the scene, they would fall to their faces, full-grown men and women, and worship as he walked by. They gave every cent that they had to him. They sold their houses and their lands, and they gave it all. They were attracted to a power. The Mormons, <laughs> you meet one, you've met them all, because they all feel just alike. They've got the same spirit, the spirit of Moroni. And yet their young people are a credit to this world. They do a shame in some areas. They come knocking on your door and knocking on my door. And those kids save enough money in their high school years to foot their bill for two years on this soil and other soil. They save their money. They do not squander it in hamburgers and hamburger joints. They save it to support themselves for two years to do missionary work, to propagate that damnable doctrine. They do it! And they walk your streets and they walk my streets and they ride bicycles and they eat macaroni and cheese because it will sustain them for two years. We do not ask you to do what that guru asked his followers to do. We do not ask our young people to save their money and to propagate for two years at their own expense, crisscrossing this country and the nations of the earth. We do not do it. The Jehovah Witnesses believe that unless they go door to door, there is no way for them to be saved. In Schenectady, New York, an old man, he is an albino, his skin is white, his eyes are pink like a rabbit. He wears a huge hat in the summertime and dark glasses to protect himself. I met him on the street one day. I said to him, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm a witness. I said, no, you're not. I'm a witness. I'm the real Jehovah Witness. You're not. I am. And that's how it really is. They're not the Jehovah Witnesses. We are the Jehovah Witnesses. We are the real Jehovah Witnesses. And I began to testify to him. He said, but sir, I've got to do this. He said, I've got to do this. He said, because if I don't, my soul will be lost. We do not command you to go door to door. And then the Hare Krishnas, which I've already given you a mental picture of them. They dress the way they dress shave their heads and if you've ever seen pictures of them they've got this yellow streak going down their forehead you know what that is liquid cow manure because they worship the brahmin bull and their leaders pour that stuff on their foreheads and it runs off their nose that is darkness that is darkness how is it that people will do all of these things for these other religions I'll tell you why they do it, because there's a power. There are spirits of power that get a hold of them, and it persuades them to live the way that they live. They give up everything. The power of demons gets a hold of them. And I have met some of them. They attract the children of the wealthy, the intellectual, college students, go through all those things and dress that way. I was in New York City in Manhattan. A bunch of them were dancing on the street corner, beating drums. One boy's eyes were glassy, and he was beginning to froth at the mouth. It was in the summertime. He was chanting just out of his head, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, beating a drum and dancing up and down. I walked over to them, and I said, what are you people doing? here they said we're bringing peace to the city I said ma'am this is not peace this is mass confusion I can bring you peace because I know the Prince of Peace I know the one I know the one who is the Prince of Peace his name is Jesus they did not want to hear that people if there was ever a day when we ought to come out of our shell and out of our places and out of our hiding situations we ought to come out now and stand up straight and tall and say I am one of them I believe I believe you've got to repent I believe you've got to go to water in Jesus' name. Yes, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the only true Son of the living God. His name is Jesus. He is the invisible made visible. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. There is only one God. His name is Jesus. Yes, you've got to go to water in Jesus' name. You've got to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues. You've got to have it. You've got to have it. This is the hour. To do it. What we need, and I have said all of that to say this, what 
we need now is the power of God. We've got everything else. And everything else is not even sufficient for some of our people. They're tired of the barriers. They're tired of the fences. And it's not enough. The power. You see, a lot of things that we have turned as revivals in the past really were not revivals. They were reformations within four walls. Revival is when the Spirit of God goes out into the streets and highways and begins to tug at your neighbor's heart in the nighttime and they cannot stay away from the house of God and they begin to come and when the preaching goes forth they begin to repent and cry and they are converted. That is revival. Likewise, a lot of things we have in our services we think sometimes because people leap and shout and run and speak with tongues and clap and fall out that we've had a powerful service we probably have not had a powerful service at all. We have only had a joyful service. The joy of the Lord will cause you to leap for joy, cause you to dance, to wave your hands, to worship God. The joy of the Lord will do that. And we've got to have it because the joy of the Lord is our strength. We need to clap. We need to, to walk. We need to pray in the Spirit. We need to suddenly just explode and go 40 directions. Yeah. Because it strengthens us. It helps us. But what we really need is the power of God. When the power of God comes into a service, when the real power, not the joy, but when the power of God comes into the service, what happens is sinners begin to convulse with contrition, conviction. They begin to cry and give the backs Abused because they feel something and they can't fight it. They can't fight it. And the devil begins to loosen his tentacles on individuals and they begin to run to an altar and they begin to cry out to God. The power of God will cause people to suddenly stand at their feet out of wheelchairs. The power of God will cause people to throw down crutches. The power of God will cause saints to fall on their faces and begin to moan and groan as the glory of the Holy One walks among us. As the power of God begins to sweep through us. What we need in our day is not more joy, not more dancing and shouting, but we need now the real power of God to come in among us. We need the gifts of the Spirit in full operation. We need the gift of faith. And by that I mean when the Spirit of God becomes so pleased with our platform that He Himself is now free to walk into the sanctuary and to do His own ministering among the people. He can walk the aisles Himself. There's no acclaim brought to any individual. It's just Him out there and you. It's just Him out there and you. Right there where you're seated. Suddenly He comes in on the scene and suddenly the pain disappears and the leg begins to grow and the arm becomes straightened and the headache goes away and angels begin to filter in when that type of thing happens when the real gift of faith begins to operate angels suddenly come through the walls they didn't bother to come through the doors they just come through the walls and through the ceiling and they begin to walk among you and minister in among you and suddenly where you are seated with your own faith something touches you and a spine straightens I'm telling you it is beginning to happen all over this country all over this country in this hour the gift of faith and the laying on of hands is becoming unleashed among our preachers and among our people because it is the end of the age and you're going to see one of the greatest moves of God you have ever seen in the history of mankind because the building of the latter house is going to be greater than the former and the latter rain is going to be seven times greater than the former rain it's not going to be 3,000 it's going to be 21,000 it's going to be 21,000 in one day receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost I'm telling on you tonight, we are not going to have anything less than a real book of Acts revival with signs and wonders following. Would you clap again and loosen yourself for what is about to happen in this place? Hallelujah, Jesus. 
I have seen some of the greatest miracles of healing in all the years of my ministry this past year. And I'll tell you where it's happening. It's happening in the churches that are holding the line. Because, friend of mine, you can come from anything to this, and we all have. But you cannot go from this to anything else, because there is nothing else to go to. When you have come to this, it's the end of the line. It's the end of your religiosity search. It is the end of your theological discoveries. When you have come to this, you have arrived. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. What we need in our day is preachers doing more than just preaching as we have heard so eloquently and so gloriously done. We do not need Bible school graduates coming and doing a little sermonette or whatever and tying up their throat and waiting to be taken out to eat. We need somebody to get down off this podium and this platform and get into the audience where they are and go after them. In New York State, we fight devils in New York State. I need somebody that will go over the pew and get a hold of them and drag them out of that area and try to help them to find the reality of a resurrected Christ whose name is Jesus of whose kingdom there shall never ever be an end. We need ministers in our day who will get a hold of God and go after them and be fearless and fear nothing or no thing. Ah! Uh. I am a preacher, but first and foremost, I am a minister. He called me to minister to the ills and to the ills of others. I am facing men today who are going to be mightily used by God before this thing is over. I am facing women today, and there are men behind me who are going to be mightily used by God before this thing is over. I saw one of the most tremendous miracles last summer in the Oregon camp meeting. It was one of the greatest camp meetings ever been in. And the reason it was is because the people were in one mind and one accord. 1,500 people. They did not fellowship at the back. They cl I watched them. They climbed over pews and they laid hands on each other and they ministered to each other. I didn't know this then, the first night. But after the first night service was over, several had received the Holy Ghost. We went out to eat. And Brother Johnson said to me, he said, Brother Stone King, do you remember... Do you remember a little boy that you prayed for that was dying of leukemia at the general conference in Anaheim? I said, yes, I do. He said, did you ever hear the end of that story? I said, no, I didn't. And I don't hear the end of lots of stories because I pray for many people and I never know what happens to them. But at the end of that conference, that one service that night, Bill Harden came to me and he said, Brother Stone King, there's a mother over here who has brought her baby all the way to this conference. He's three years old. I'm giving you some details now. And he is dying with leukemia. He said, would you come and pray? I said, you'll have to lead me to her. To her. I don't know where to go. Brother Harden led me around to this woman. Here was a woman holding a little boy. The baby body was already beginning to disintegrate. He could not even open his eyes. The mother with one arm was holding that baby. And with the other hand, she was worshiping. She was worshiping God. She had driven 12 hours one way to bring that baby to that service. The doctors have said he's only got a short time to live. Take him anywhere you want to take him because he's dying. Enjoy him as long as you can. The baby was practically unconscious. The body was beginning to deteriorate. Bill Harden, you stood there and you prayed with me in that conference in Anaheim for that baby and I felt the power of God. The power, not the joy, but the power. And that mother trembled and shook. I never knew what happened. In a restaurant after the first night service in that camp meeting, Brother Johnson said, would you like to hear the story? I said, yes. He said, Brother Stonking, that mother and that baby, they're from my district. He said, that baby was totally healed from that moment on. That baby sat up and took nourishment and the hemorrhaging stopped. 
I said, is that child in this conference? Is that child here in this camp meeting? He said, yes, they are. I said, I want to see that baby. I want to see the baby. Bring the child to me. And of course, it was the child is now six years of age. The next night, I walked to the side door to come to that platform. The mother stood there and that child, and they grabbed my arm and they said, this is Mark Sargent. I got down on my knees. I took that little boy in my arms and I pulled him to me. He was the picture of health. A little bow tie, a white shirt a sport jacket, his hair combed back, his eyes dancing with life and an attestation and a testimony to the fact that there really is a man called Jesus who is able to do anything, who is able to do all things and that nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. That little guy put his arms around my neck and I worshiped God for truth and went onto the platform. On Wednesday night, there was such a move of the Spirit. There was a man who had polio. He had braces on his legs and with crutches, he came down that middle aisle toward the end of the preaching. Faith gripped his heart and his soul and he came walking down that aisle. When he got to the front, as he raised his hands, the crutches fell to the side and he began to worship God and speak with tongues all of a sudden without the aid of the crutches he turned and he began to walk and when he began to walk the people began to worship the power of God came in that place and things were just every which way all of a sudden I was walking through this this tangle it was a tangle this tangle at the altar and I felt this tug on my pants leg I looked down here was this little boy Mark Sargent I said, buddy, what are you doing down here? You're going to get trampled in all of this. Let me get you out of here. I, he said, oh, I'm all right. He said, did that man really walk without crutches? I said, buddy, look at him. Can you see him going? He said, yes. I said, come on, let me get you out of here. I just lifted him over the altar rail and put him on my lap. I said, would you like to have the Holy Ghost? He said, oh, no, no, not me. He was afraid. I said, but would you just let me pray for you? I put one hand on that little guy's chest and one hand on his back, and I started to say, oh, Jesus, give him the Holy Ghost just because I want it. And that little guy I bent double and he burst out speaking with tongues when I when I went to the pulpit and said Mark Sargent has got the Holy Ghost the whole district knew that boy they knew his story he said they're speaking with tongues it was at that point a girl whose name was Esther who was confined to a wheelchair who had a motorized wheelchair who was in that in those services each night Esther was the first one to come to the altar in a motorized wheelchair every night she was the first one to get to the altar when that man walked and Mark received the Holy Ghost I watched this crippled woman I watched her with her own hands with no little effort begin to pull and rip apart the leather braces on her wrist and her fingers she ripped them apart while we stood and watched her and she threw them to the floor and with no little effort she struggled and pulled on the arms of the wheelchair until she stood and when she raised her hand she was speaking with tongues and when the people saw that the glory and the power of God came into that place we prayed for her she sat back down they took me out to eat like we do I did not know the rest of the story that night but you see Esther Esther was staying in a tent on the campgrounds. Sister Mangan, that cripple, was sleeping in the grass. And she was crawling from the grass to the wheelchair. And she was coming to that meeting. That's more than some people will do who are not crippled. There are some of us who would not sleep on the ground and walk to hear the word of God but this cripple did she did and she was the first one to the altar each night but after that episode of her standing in the night the women found out she was in a tent on the ground they moved her into the ladies dormitory and they so they could help her and that night in the women's dormitory she had a seizure and they called the paramedics and they came they came and they rushed her to the emergency room at the local hospital the doctor took one look at her he said this woman is dying I'll give her two weeks at the outmost six weeks he said you need to put her in a nursing home 
home immediately. Please put this woman in a nursing home. Don't take her back to that crowd. It will only aggravate and agitate this condition and this situation. But Esther had enough consciousness about her to hear this conversation. And with no little effort, she looked at those Pentecostals who had accompanied her. And she said, please, please don't take me away from the people of God. Please don't take me away from the presence of God. Take me back to the campground. Take me back to the campground. And so you know how Pentecostals are. They scooped her up and they took her back to the campground and they prayed for her in the women's dormitory and God touched her and her pulse rose and her heartbeat returned and she was all right. She was the first one to the altar on Thursday night. She was the first one to the altar. And the Spirit of God was moving and things were happening and people were receiving the Holy Ghost. I felt impressed of God to go down to her and I did. And I prayed a certain prayer. And I walked over here to help some young man receive the Holy Ghost. And as I was praying for him, there was a terrible explosion behind me. But there had been a lot of explosions in this situation. So it was nothing new. So I just sort of looked around to see what was going on. There was just a terrible confusion. Hands were waving and everything. Feet were kicking. And I was trying to get this boy through the Holy Ghost that didn't want to leave him. But I had a friend there from the Northeast, and she was already up on a, on a pew yelling and waving her hands. This bunch down here was on. They were all on pews, like spectators waving their hands. The preachers were on the platform. They were all waving their hands and going at it. And she said to me, Brother Stonke, you need to see this. I said, well, what is it? She said, well, come and see. So I left the boy. I got on a pew so I could look over. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God had touched Esther, and she stood to her feet and her hands straightened and she began to walk she began to walk by the power of the spirit of the lord and when she began to walk the saints and the preachers began to fall in behind her and they made a highway open for her and the saints began to sing his truth is marching on his truth is marching on and as they sang it was one of the greatest things i have ever seen she led a victory march around that whole auditorium and she left the wheelchair empty she came marching down this aisle she went to another woman in a wheelchair and she tried to pull her out she wanted her to walk also she wanted her to get out of that wheelchair let's clap for just a moment because there is something building in this place tonight and today something explosive is in this place hallelujah hallelujah Jesus That night when the service was over, Esther walked out of there and they left the wheelchair empty at the altar. It was awesome. The next morning she got up, she dressed herself, showered herself, and she walked into the dining room and sat down and ate breakfast like a normal person. She was in the morning Bible study that Brother Jesse Williams taught. She was waving her hands and taking notes and worshiping God. She showed up Friday afternoon for choir rehearsal. She sang in the choir on Friday night. She danced in the spirit in that service. And on Saturday morning she was in the kitchen doing cleanup duty to break camp and they left the wheelchair empty at the altar I am telling you today that the power of God is upon us to do signs and wonders and miracles but we have got to break out of all of this People, the real issue is not our modesty and our holiness and our standards. I've heard that till I am sick of hearing that. It's not that. The reason we don't have revival is not because of the way we look and the way we act and the things we don't do. The reason we're not having revival is because we don't have a hold of this power I'm talking about right here. We don't have a hold of this. I believe, Brother Usher, we can have it all. I believe we can have all of it. We can have the modesty and the holiness. We can have the presence of God. We can have the truth. And we can also have signs and wonders and miracles it's not that that is holding us back it's that we do not have a hold of this power this power of God and the gifts of the Spirit in our lives hallelujah you may be seated the Spirit of God is in this place and the gift of faith is in this place say that the gift of faith is in this place say it again the gift of faith is in this place and because Jesus is here anything can happen anything can happen 
Not because I am here, but because He is here. It's not because I am who I am, but it is because He is who He is. Jesus is here, and because He is here, anything, anything can happen in this place tonight. Now, everyone say now. There are people here with deformities in your body. There are people here right now who have difficulties with your spines. There are people here right now who have got things wrong with your neck. There are some people here that cancer is already beginning to fester in your bodies. And down the road someplace there will be a prognosis and a diagnosis. But I'm here to tell you that one greater than all the prognoses and all the diagnoses. There's someone greater here today whose name is Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has never changed and because he is here suddenly where you are an angel can slip up to you and just simply touch you and just simply take a hold of your hand and everything can be made all right in the power of the name that is above every name even the name of the resurrected one whose name I reiterate to you in your hearing is the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth who is alive forevermore and forevermore and forevermore. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah, hallelujah, they say, they say that this wonderful expectant mother has got a deformed baby in her womb, I know somebody who can perform surgery without making an incision, I pray for you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Let this fetus be healed in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus so be it unto you in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus now do you believe that do you really believe that we cannot go through the motions we cannot go through the motions we got to believe this thing hallelujah that's it, 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 that's it. That's what I'm talking about right there. That's what I'm talking about right there. That's what I'm talking about. The power, the power, the power of God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm almost, I'm almost finished. Just stay on your feet. But while all of this is going on, and while God is touching you with faith, and angels are in this place ministering to you, I just came from Stockton, California, the last night of their landmark convention. There were over 3,000 people there. They were jammed in every direction. There was a woman in the balcony that the Spirit of God went to, and she had been in an accident in September. She was in excruciating pain. She was headed for the neurologist and the neuro neurosurgeons, and they had already prognosed and diagnosed. But while she sat in the audience, uh, Jesus had heard her prayer. He had seen her. There was a hand that came from nowhere. It put itself upon her, her head. She thought a friend of hers was praying for her. But the hand began to push her head back, which she was not able to do. And she opened her eyes, and there was nobody standing there. And she knew it had to be God. And it was God. And the pain vanished and left her body. There was a man. They rolled a man down in a wheelchair to the altar. This man came down to the altar in a wheelchair. And they gathered around him. I never went near him but the brethren got around him and they began to pray all of a sudden he shot to his feet but what the congregation did not see was at the appointed time in the spirit there was an angel either side of that man that just simply lifted him up we just got a hold of that man and pulled him up out of there you'll find angels down here dancing with this woman you'll find them ministering wherever the miracles are taking place that man shot to his feet he looked so surprised and he began to walk around and when he began to walk he pushed that wheelchair out of that meeting he pushed it out I was walking down the, a jammed aisle I mean it was jammed full of people and all of a sudden I was trying to get through and I was passing a bunch of men and one man just shoved another man right to me I mean he just shoved him to me and he yelled this man needs the Holy Ghost he was a stranger and mean eyeball to eyeball that I've never seen before and someone screaming saying he needs the Holy Ghost I said sir do you want the Holy Ghost do you believe in the Holy Ghost have you heard about it he said yes I said do you want it he said yes I said here it comes I put my hands on his chest he 
fell backwards speaking with tongues. If I have the story correct, he was a Baptist preacher. If I have the story correct, he was a Baptist. I'm saying to you, I am saying to you that that spirit is in this place today. It is in this place today. It is in this place today. That spirit, that spirit of power, 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 not joy, but power. I hear the sound of weeping. I went from there to Northern California, Brother Underwood's church in Yuba City. We had a conference. One pastor's daughter came to the altar who had been in pain for six months. The pain suddenly vanished. A teenage girl whose spine was crooked from scoliosis. God straightened her spine. That teenage girl began to dance in circles on that platform. When the people saw it, faith raised so high. God moved in that place. This is how important this is that I'm telling you about. There was one preacher who came to me, who confessed to me. He had always been against the moving of the Spirit and a lot of demonstration. He had always been against the gifts of the Spirit and all this business. He said, Brother Stoking, something has happened to me. Something has happened to me in this meeting. He went home on Sunday night. His people were so fired up with faith and what they had seen that they got into a demonstration of worshiping and the power of God swept through. They broke out the back doors. They told me and the saints ran around the building outside and they baptized five in the name of Jesus Christ that night because I'm saying to you that God is wanting to get loose in Bill Hardin's church just a few weeks ago there were a lot of miracles that happened but one boy just in the audience of cataract disappeared from his eye just simply disappeared from his eye people today there is something in this place you know where it is this is my last statement to you they did not like what Jesus taught they did not like his theology they did not like his doctrine they hated him for it but they could cope with his doctrine they could cope with his teaching they could explain it away because you see he was not ceremonially garbed the way they were he was just sort of a, you know out in the countryside he didn't look like them or act like them they could handle that but there was one thing they could not handle they couldn't handle it on the Sabbath day <sighs> When the little man with the withered hand came into the presence of the master of the universe, this man called Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched forth a withered hand and he pulled it back. Oh. And Jesus, Jesus made the boys in the temple look bad. They couldn't compete with him. They had their sermons, they had their programs. They had all the rituals, they had the buildings, they had everything. They had the platform, they had everything. They had it sewed up, but they could not compete with this one who stood in front of a tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came walking out of the grave. They could not compete. They could not compete. Wake up, Pentecostal preacher. We've got it all. But when you begin to lay hands on and they begin to walk out of wheelchairs and throw down crutches, uh, I'm telling you, they cannot compete with us out there. They cannot compete. They cannot compete. They cannot compete. And that is what God is trying to tell us in this hour. Gospel. I have chosen you apart from myself. If you will obey me, then 
you will do the things that I did and greater things than you than this shall you do. Follow me, believe me, speak the word and let me back you up, saith the Lord. I will stand with you and I will honor your word. Let us clap our hands and lift our voices to the presence of the Lord. As Queen Esther, as Queen Esther presented herself to the king, so I ask of you today, if you are interested in the power of God, would you come as they begin to sing and present yourself there to this power, need of the hour? You'll have it. In the blood Hallelujah. Of the 